Today's video is incredibly requested. I am going to be comparing my worst and my best Oxford essay. And let me tell you, there is a massive difference. Astronomical. So the main body of our worst essay actually doesn't start off too badly. I do link the start of this paragraph to the previous paragraph and I do give a topic sentence. That is what you need, however, that is where the good stops. <laughs> it isn't a fully explained point. The next sentence just really doesn't add a lot. Where I've said, museums were places where objects could be displayed and arranged systematically by ethnologists and anthropologists in order to make them easier to understand. I haven't gone into any detail there. What are they understanding? How does it make them easier to understand? Actually, what does it make it easier to understand in terms of ideology? This is within a whole colonial framework and that's just not mentioned until the end of the essay and it really needs mentioning now. I've not mentioned anything to do with the social evolutionist background to this theory so what Pitt Rivers actually did is he arranged all of his objects in visual order it wasn't time order he did things from different periods in history but he did it by visual so if he thought it was primitive he put it at the start if he thought it, it was advanced where, wherever it came from whatever period of history he put it at the end so what you ended up with was different tools from thousands of years ago put next to tribes that Pitt Rivers had deemed primitive and as you can probably tell by literally just hearing that there is some clear colonial undertones here that I have not even touched on in my essay and because of that I've kind of missed the whole point. It's lazy basically. At the time I might not have understood to be honest because I've had extra lessons on this since. What it has meant is that my essay hasn't been able to have that extra layer of inference and understanding. I haven't shown a proper understanding despite making that point. It's like writing a P paragraph without the explanation. I've got the evidence. I've talked about Pitt Rivers collection. However, I've actually done it wrong <laughs> because he didn't arrange them in age. So not only have I tried to give evidence, I've interpreted it wrong. That's great. What up? I'm Jared, I'm 19, and I never- So here I have brought in some other, like, names of museums and talked about how they arrange things by date. What I haven't really done then is linked it back to the question. What I could have done here, a complete missed opportunity, was explained how modern museums may be different and how therefore what ethnographic museums are for has changed through time. Has it changed? Has it stayed the same? I've completely missed that out. And that would have given a whole extra layer to my essay. <laughs> it's, it's just poor. It's poor. The second paragraph starts with no real link to the previous one. I've made a statement and I've chosen a quote that doesn't really link, it doesn't flow, it's just completely another separate point. There's more in the end of the essay that should have gone before this and I've just not planned it enough. And you can tell that I haven't sat down and thought, right, this is my structure, I've literally just sat and typed it out and that is never going to work. I've clearly not gone back over it, I've not readjusted things, I've not redrafted, I've just finished it, sent it off, done. So the statement I then make about the quote, the fact that most ethnographic museums were founded around this time suggests that ethnologists really wanted to take more care of collected objects and ensure that they were accessible to all, not just wealthy collectors, doesn't even link to the quote. Where in that quote does it tell you what time you're writing in? The fact that I've referred to around this time doesn't fit anywhere. I haven't linked it to anything. Now this end bit is good. This saves it a little bit. So this quote backs up the idea that ethnographic museums were brought about in order to help classify and arrange artifacts because it suggests that previously people hoarded collections purely to novel value rather than academic value. That is a sort of valid point and it does bring this paragraph back like it suggests why I've used a quote. I'm not sure it's correct and I'm not really sure that's what the quote does suggest, to be honest. 
Because to me, that quote is suggesting that actually all the stuff that's been collected up and put into a museum is there out of novel and curious curiosity value and it suggests that actually ethnographic museums were places to showcase this novelty, to showcase the curiosities of the world. I haven't picked a quote that actually backs up that point, I've just explained what I was trying to present, which is, is not gonna, it's not gonna cut it. You can't just try and explain what is in your head and not put a I once again also haven't mentioned the colonial racist undertones here. You know, the whole novelty and curiosity stuff is purely signifying an us and them divide between, you know, the white English middle class and everybody else, but mostly the people who are living in the colonies whose stuff has been stolen and put in this museum. It's not mentioned at all. Now, paragraph three does link Enjoying the novelty may work had I actually explained the us-them us dichotomy of the colonialism and the artifact collection. What is good about this line though is it does link to the previous whilst also talking about what I'm actually going to move on to, dis to discuss, which I should have done throughout the essay and not just in like sporadic paragraphs. Now I'm not too unhappy about where this paragraph goes, particularly the critique at the end. There were arguably places where availability of knowledge was not divided by class as qualifications and substantial amounts of money were not needed to view collections. However, this argument is questionable as it could be said that lack of cultural capital among working classes acted as an invisible barrier to knowledge anyway. This is a valid critique and it is about the only place in the whole essay where I really do this and it needs to be more so. What I have completely missed in this paragraph on the teaching about the artefacts and the teaching about people is that, for example, the Pitt Rivers nowadays is very much a teaching facility for not just children and the local people, but there are community projects linked with those whose artefacts, you know, the communities whose artefacts they actually are. And I've completely missed that ethnographic museums are changing in what they're for from just basic oh, we're educating people about the empire in the 1800s to now being centres of communication between indigenous groups and the West. Places of repatriation and also places of real politics and debate because these artefacts have lives in themselves in the sense that they were taken, they now have and symbolise colonial rule. And I haven't discussed anything about that in this section and I just really cut off and it's a complete missed opportunity. This paragraph again starts off okay, I've got a statistic to back up what I'm saying, I've talked about the tours, the educational talks, again continuing from the previous paragraph, it links, it flows. It just doesn't really go anywhere. So what I have tried to do here, emphasis on tried, is talk about how the use of ethnographic museums and what they're for changes over time. However, it's just not very well explained at all. Now, the fact that I picked up on how you learn from an ethnographic museum is completely individual and is based on individual interests is good. So what I could have done there with explicit links to the question is say what an ethnographic museum is for is completely individual to every person. It is individual because some people will go for learning, other people will go to be closer to their ancestors in terms of indigenous groups. Those indigenous groups might also go and to them an ethnographic museum is simply for perpetuating colonial ideology and it, I've just not mentioned how it's a completely subjective meaning. Now, in terms of this paragraph, I'm not going to go over the subject matter because, again, it's it's not brilliant. But um, my main point here is that I keep saying the whole book name and you just don't need to do that. It wastes words. I think that's probably what I was intending on doing at the time, to be honest. But all you need to do is say Harris and O'Hanlon and then put their date. I've also actually misreferenced it as well. Because instead of just using the Johannes Fabian 1983, I've said found in and quoted within. Like I explained at the beginning, that is just not something that you should be doing. Also in this paragraph, I do keep using words such as perhaps, and also while this is a strong statement, also just 
basically not being confident in presenting my ideas. It is an actual known thing that women in particular in essays use things like this suggests that perhaps I would argue that but or does this make sense it's it's a lack of confidence if if you're putting an idea across be assertive just say it otherwise it just detracts from the argument besides the fact that what I'm saying is true now paragraph six is good because we finally discuss the us and them dichotomy Paragraph 7 again is good, but it's just in the wrong place and this is another example of where my structure is just completely off and planning would have been a much better idea. It just doesn't flow. I've mentioned the British Empire and artefacts from abroad much earlier on. Why didn't I just discuss it then? You need to plan, is what I'm saying. So how did I do better in my best essay then? So here you can see I have got subtitles. They're proper long subtitles, they're informative, they tell you exactly what it's going to explain and it is linked back to the question. What this subtitle and any subtitle allows you to do is to completely introduce a new area of topic but tell the reader exactly how it fits so that when they read it they're not confused as to why you've suddenly moved on to this different area. It just means that you can present two wildly different areas of argument but explain explicitly how they link and then essentially what I've done in this one for example is I've got two different strains of argument and then in the conclusion have linked them together and it, it has just made it much easier to follow and also to write and to keep your own peace of mind while you're writing it is much easier to have subtitles. So the start of this paragraph really sets the scene. I'm talking about Buddhist cave temples because we're relating it back to the question of art, architecture and archaeology. So I need to explain exactly which area of art, architecture and archaeology I'm going to be talking about. So I've done that here. I've used a citation. I've said how many there are, how old they are and what actual bits of art, what purpose they're for. And then, this is the key part, I've said exactly why I'm using those and what I'm going to be arguing. That is the key. Explain why and how it links back to your question. So generally this whole section is just much better explained than the other essay. There's much more insightful points, I've really thought about them, they're not lazy, I've explained everything, I've used a lot of citations, I've talked about individual murals, what people can learn from them again and kept linking it back. So here for example I've discussed what the murals mean but then I've linked it back. So if anything the existence of Buddhist murals in various regions along the Silk Road including North Korea, China and Afghanistan is a sure sign of the religion's vast expansion out of India and across the Asian continent which directly links to the question which is talking about how you can link art to the spread along the Silk Road of Buddhism. And again, in this paragraph, as you can see, I've first off introduced it. So the cultural tradition of mural painting was not unique to the Buddhist narrative though, which completely links to how I've ended the previous paragraph on the spread of Buddhism using mural painting. So here I've given basically a critique, an alternate argument, talking about how in the local area in general, people were using murals as a way of setting out their ideas and their culture. So it's not directly asked of in the question, it is going above and beyond, but it does then link right back to the question. So how I've linked it back is by saying that these Assyrian reliefs, though Islamic, must have taken influence from Buddhism because the murals that were Buddhist were all there before and all kind of in the same place. So I've said ultimately this then means that Buddhism was an incredibly powerful and far-reaching ideology along the Silk Road and they've influenced other cultures. Now whether that's right or not doesn't matter because I have confidently portrayed the point and I've given evidence and that's all's needed in an essay. Now this second section is not explicit to the question at all but I wanted to bring a whole nother angle and layer to this essay in order to discuss 
the comparisons that could be made between the West and the East at a very similar time in history. So I've said, it is common knowledge that there are archaeological remains of Roman monumental architecture all across the Roman provinces. It is perhaps equally well known that rich, powerful members of Roman society were often the ones to build said architecture and make sure to name it after themselves or to leave grand epigraphic evidence of their achievements. So why are Buddhist and other Asian monumental architectural sites as well as acts of eugetism not discussed to a similar level. So this is opening a whole nother level of argument that is still discussing Buddhist art along the Silk Road but is now saying why is it not looked at on the same sort of page? Why are we looking at it completely differently? And like I said it's not completely answering the question but here I've explained why I'm talking about it. I'll be referring to evidence largely from the Duntuan cave complex and will ultimately aim to argue that the spread of Buddhism, linking back to the question, may have been further accelerated by acts of eugetism resulting in more monumental complexes from within which Buddhism could be practiced and celebrated. So here what's being said is that the spread of Buddhism might actually have been accelerated by architecture and art building as people wanted to leave their mark on the local area and show their contribution by building things and putting their name on it. And ultimately, if you've built something and put your name on it and it is a Buddhist statue, people are going to see it. So that might then have caused other people to go, ah, oh, I'm going to do the same thing, but further away. So it helps the spread. So I've not just gone straight in, I've discussed the terms again, so I've said exactly what monumentalism is explained why I think this Buddhist art is a form of monumentalism and also given an example so this Buddha is 33 meters tall and also I've discussed why I think it's eugetism so what eugetism is is when somebody or a family builds something specific and then calls it after them. A good example here in the Western world is the theatre of Pompey. But this cannot be ignored as adding fuel to the flames of Buddhism and the flourishing of Buddhist art. So I've then interacted with the piece of writing. So I agree with Xi Chang and argue that acts of eugetism such as this one played an equally important role in the latest spread of Buddhism as missionaries did in the earlier periods. And then again explained why I say this because such buildings and sculpture must have brought widespread attraction and attention to the religion as word of their existence spread. As you can see, again, it all links back to the question. So the main difference is then in the actual main body of the essay is that this essay is assertive and confident where the other one just simply was not. There's interaction with sources and it's on a much higher level. It is properly explained. The quotes have been chosen carefully. There's no laziness in it. They're fully explained, they're fully presented, correctly presented. There's imagery that adds another layer to it because you can actually see for yourself what is being discussed. I could quite easily have put photos in the other essay and I just didn't. I didn't put any time into it on the same level as I have on this one. The subtitles in this one really help with the structure and in each section I've referred not only back to the subtitle but also back to the overall question which ties not only the, all the work to the question but also really reinforces the structure that I've chosen to use for the essay. Now at the end of this section here I've finished with a really good summation of the complexities surrounding the spread of Buddhism and the relation that art had with that. So, for example here, I've made a point about how West and East might actually be way more interacted and connected as we once thought, specifically with links to Buddhism. And on the surface you might not see it, but actually there might be really clear links between Western civilizations and Buddhist civilizations and which we can see through art and grandeur and architecture. And I think that just shows that there's a lot more thought gone in and a lot more understanding of the topic to the point where I've been able to bring in a different approach. And we move on to the conclusion. Now I think you can probably see one thing that I'm going to say is wrong with this already and that is that it is far too long. We have 372 words here, that's not what you want. You want it to be quick, short, snappy like the introduction, quickly set out 
your argument, the key thing you've argued, the key people if you wanted to. You could literally say, in this essay I argued that, da 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 da, backed up by such and such, such and such and such and such. What I've done, which I didn't need to do, is basically summed up every single person's argument again. Essentially, just answer the question, but only answer the question using things you have already discussed. I think there's two or three incidences in this paragraph where I've presented a whole new argument and a whole new, like, quote. Another thing is that it is the first time in the conclusion where I've mentioned the word racism. If I'm gonna bring up something like that in the conclusion it needs to have been put in all the way through and I have tried what I didn't do is be assertive so what I've done in the main body has been so wishy-washy and said perhaps it's almost as if so now it makes the conclusion kind of fall down there's no real grounds for it because I've not been assertive throughout so that's why you do need to be confident so that your conclusion actually stands has some grounds you need foundations in order to make the tower stand up, you know? Now, on the good side, we have our conclusion here. It is much shorter, it's only 270 words, so it's a whole hundred words less. However, it presents so much more. There's so much more in this than in the other one, despite it being shorter. It clearly states what's been argued. So here I put, in this essay, I have explored ways in which Buddhism, from its beginnings to the rise of the Islamic Empire, spread significantly out of India which is what the question's asking. So I've said that I have explained it, then I've said how. So I've said I've argued that the Silk Road played a key role in this spread because of trade and missionary routes, and also how we can see this as it's evidenced by art and architecture, which again is the key part of the question. I've said again which specific pieces of art, and also talked about something that is really important. So whilst the question mentions what, how can it be evidenced through art, architecture and archaeology, I've explained that actually it is an oral language so it may have been way more widespread than the three things the question's asking for can present and that again is engaging with the question. One thing I could have done better in this is expanded on this last sentence. So this is something that you should be doing in essays and particularly things like dissertations is stating what area of research would be interesting to continue with after submitting this essay. So I've said it would be extremely interesting to see further study into this area. I've not really said why but I have gone very over the word count so it doesn't matter too much in a shorter essay but it's the fact that I have discussed an area that is new to this research and relates in a way and then said actually it would be really useful to continue with this and I just did not do any of that in my other essay. So it just shows an extra level of interaction, an extra level of understanding of what is important in the topic and what actually needs more research into it to add that on the end. So very quickly before we finish I'm just going to mention the references. The references on my worst essay are appalling. I've only got four in the whole thing there's only four, that is not enough references and even though I've listed these ones, I had extra ones in the text, I've just not referenced them because I've said oh well they're already cited in these wider readings, that's not how to do it, you have to cite everything, if you've quoted someone you write them, the person who said it in your bibliography don't write down the person whose book they've been quoted in. I would probably be aiming for a 2000 word essay to have 6 to 10 references. Not 4 though, that's not enough. 6 to 10 is your best bet. That could literally be like a couple of words in a quote for a definition. Like it doesn't have to be a whole argument based on one thing, but either way you need more. In my other one I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So we've got 9 references in this one and they're properly used. I've also got my figures written down for my pictures. They're all correctly, correctly referenced apart from one in the introduction that I did spot that was missing. Yeah, I've got a feeling this is going to be a long video but I hope that it was helpful. I hope that you enjoyed, you asked for it, I've delivered. If you would like to see me rewrite that terrible essay and make it better and explain why I've made it better then I will do that just give me a thumbs up and let me know in the comments so oh, I hope it was helpful 
um, my voice now needs to rest. Thank you for watching and subscribe if you want more. Definitely subscribe if you want to see the extra essay videos that I'm going to make after this. Bye!